is up, everybody? Welcome into episode 11 of All Say This with Chris Castellani. I am your host, Chris Castellani. By the time you're listening to this or watching this, it will be a day later, but happy Easter to all those who celebrate. If you're watching this on YouTube and wondering why I'm dressed a little bit less awful than usual, it is because I just got back from Easter dinner with the family, but now we are here to record a new episode of All Say This. Going to be talking a lot of baseball stuff uh, per usual. Well, that that will be the case during these these months. Bit of Tiger stuff. Do you want to talk about Justin Verlander? There was a uh, an uproar on Tiger's social media over the weekend as Justin Verlander in his second start absolutely dealt a lot of people clamoring that the Tigers should have made more of a push to sign him. I will talk about that. And in, in our last segment today, we're going to get uh, pretty personal. I liked the last show we did. And at least according to YouTube, I think it was our least watched show, so maybe I'm making a mistake here. But in my opinion, uh, and it's the reason I liked the last episode, I think that the best shows, the best podcasts are the ones in which you get to really know the host, in which you feel a connection. Uh, with the host. I mean, to make a barstool, you know, a- analogy here, I think part of my take is so successful because you really feel a connection to uh, PFT and to Big Cat and to Hank and to Jake Marsh, whoever they have on. And they, you know, they're great interviewers and, and, and great guys. Obviously, I want to create something like that. So I'm going to get a little bit personal and talk about some stuff that I probably haven't talked about at least extensively. Maybe I have uh, on previous podcasts I-, I did before I came to Barstool, but uh, just stay tuned for that because I think that could be a really good segment. I don't know. If it's bad, I'd probably just cut it. I think we'll have enough material today and something I've been a little bit trepidatious to talk about, but we'll discuss it today. But we are going to start by talking about the Detroit Tigers. They had their game postponed yesterday, uh, the last game of a four-game set against the Kansas City Royals. They find their record at 4-5 and right now. But sadly, the story is not really the baseball or the results on the field, though there was a really awesome moment on Friday night with Spencer Torkelson, his second career home run. It was an absolute moonshot, 432 feet off of Brad Keller to put the Tigers in front for good. They were down one nothing. Miguel Cabrera doubled. He's now five hits away from 3,000, and then Spencer Torkelson hit a two-run shot to put the Tigers in front. That was an awesome moment, and as somebody who, I put this in my blog, as someone who lives on Twitter, I think it was a moment that really connected with a lot of Tigers fans because for years, you've had people like me who've carried water for the team and said, hey, these guys down in the minors, they're really, really good, and I think they're going to do some wonderful things. But to the average fan, and for the record, there's nothing wrong with being in this fan group. I'm not saying that you're you know, intellectually inferior. In fact, you're way more normal than I am. What you care about is what's the major league team look like? Do they have any good players? Do they have any guys who are going to produce? Uh, and over the last several years, I mean, last year, with you know, they took a step forward, but for the most part, uh, the answer's been no. They haven't had a whole lot of good players. So people have talked for... Almost two years since Torkelson got drafted. We think this guy's going to be special. We think he's going to be really good. And there's something about that first significant moment. Now, obviously, he had his first hit earlier in the week, and he had his first home run a few days prior. And to be completely honest with you, Torkelson's probably been this team's best hitter over the last week with Javi Baez being injured. We'll talk about that here in a second. But he's seeing the ball pretty well. That moment, I think, connected with a lot of people because it's one of those moments that kind of shakes you out of apathy for your for a second. You're like, okay. He's here. Like, he's our guy now. I think there were, that moment came early in the season with Cade Cunningham, with the Pistons as well, where it's like, okay, now we got our guy. We've waited and we've anticipated and we've scouted. Now we're starting to see results. Where else can he go? How how high is this guy's ceiling? That was, that was really awesome. And beyond all that, I, I have a theory that when players are young and they're still on their rookie contracts and they've been coming up through the system, they're just substantially more humble than they are after they get the big free agent contract. And I'm not saying that guys you know, turn into posers after they get uh, the free agent deal, but there is something incredibly endearing about having a Spencer Torkelson on your roster and he's not a guy who's been corrupted by, you know, and not even corrupted. I mean, dude, if you get if the bag gets thrown at you, you take it. There's something about a guy who's so green behind the ears, who just wants to help his team win, who's still getting accustomed to major league life. I mean, you feel the emotions as a fan that he's probably feeling as a player. Like if I was Spencer Torkelson and Miguel Cabrera let off the inning with a double, and then you drove him in with a two-run home run, I would be skipping. I'd be doing cartwheels around the bases if I was athletic enough 
to do one. So that was a really special moment. The Tigers are four and five right now, but as I brought up earlier, outside of that Torkelson moment, the story for the for the Detroit Tigers as of this moment is not what's going on in the field. It's the injuries. As of right now, Kyle Funkhauser, Andrew Chafin, Javier Baez, are, uh, and Casey Mize are all on the IL. Uh, it is to be determined with um, Matt Manning. I also forgot about Riley Green, who has not played a game at the major league level, but started the year on the injured list as well. Robbie Grossman's dealt with a few injuries, and you have injuries to your pitching staff, especially your starting pitching staff. I know so far this season, I've been more so the optimist than I have the pessimist, and I'm going to continue to stay that way, at least as it pertains to to the pitching staff. I talked about it in the last video I made after game nine where I have faith that somehow they could they might have to put this thing together with super glue and duct tape. Somehow this pitching staff will find a way to survive until they get relatively healthy. Because no team is ever fully healthy. Like a lot of people go, oh my God, I can't believe that guy got injured. Well, every team deals with injuries. Every team that has won a World Series has had one player who's missed a substantial amount of time. Maybe not in the postseason, but a guy who's missed a, a large majority of time throughout the season. That is unfortunately how baseball works. This is abnormal though. The Tigers have suffered so many injuries to a lot of young players. I think what really has people freaking out is the fact that you have Mize and Manning, two guys that this rebuild was built upon, who may not see the field for a while. I'm under the belief that Matt Manning was just a precautionary thing. He might miss one start. I don't see this uh, you know, becoming a long-term thing. AJ even talked about it after the game on Saturday where he said, considering what happened to Casey Mize, we were not taking any chances. Now, Casey Mize is the injury that scares me a little bit more. Casey Mize with an elbow strain, you hear elbow, you know, these guys end up, you know what it leads to. Potentially, potentially. Don't press panic yet. I know nothing. I know nothing of the extent of this injury. Right now, the Tigers don't really either. He said he felt better when he woke up after his last start, so we have no idea uh, what the the extent of Casey Mize's injury is. Would I prefer to have a pitching staff that has Matt Manning and Casey Mize on it? 100 million bazillion percent, obviously. But I look back to last year, and people you know, remember this team playing well over the last four months, but I think what people forget is that they had their backs against the wall. For the last two, three months of the season, the rotation was Casey Mize on an innings limit going three innings a start, Tarek Skubal on an innings limit going three innings a start, Matt Manning, who had, what, a 5.89 ERA a season ago, Tyler Alexander and Willie Peralta, and they played above 500 baseball. When you look at how certain guys have looked so far this season, when you look at how Joe Jimenez has pitched, how Michael Farmer has pitched, I know Soto was wild, but it seems like he's going to be all right. Drew Hutchison, three scoreless the other day. He's looked sharp. Jacob Barnes has pitched some good innings. I believe that in the short term, they can be able to work through this. I think that Fetter and Hinch are going to find a way to keep this pitching staff stable until they get relatively healthy. Because, to be honest, if if you get the bullpen right and you get Chafin, Funkhauser back, all of a sudden you're looking at five or six guys in the back end of that pen that can really sling it. And you won't need your starters to go six, seven innings a night. Well, that would obviously be a luxury. It wouldn't be a necessity at that point. But as we saw at many points last season, what kept this team down was not the pitching staff. It was the fact that there were so many games in which it felt like this team was one big bat away from winning a lot of games. See, there were four, I would say four or five. There were probably about 10 games last season where they were one hit away from really breaking a game open and they weren't able to do that. Now, in the offseason, they got that big bat. Regardless of how you feel about Javi Baez, and I acknowledge Javi Baez is a flawed player. I've talked about it ad nauseum. He strikes out all the time, he never walks, like he's going to make his mistakes. Javi Baez is better than 90% of hitters in Major League Baseball. Like, that is a guy that you could put at the middle of a playoff caliber lineup, and that team is going to be pretty good. Well, now he's gone. And what happens is, offensively, you revert back to the team you were last year, which is a team that has individual pieces that might be all right, but nobody that's necessarily going to scare you. And it could get worse, because, and this is the one area that has me a little bit concerned. I do believe as the weather warms up, things will get better, but... Uh, Jamer Candelario can't be hitting like this. I mean, uh, Jamer Candelario struck out on sliders either on the bottom part of the plate or off the plate about a dozen times over the last week. 
Jonathan Scope, we know how streaky he is. He's got to stop popping out to the infield. Robbie Grossman was on base three times. Should have been four, nearly four, uh, against the Royals on Saturday. Robbie's going to find his way back just because he draws so many walks. He's, he's a patient hitter. I think he got off to a bit of a slow start. He did last year as well. I'm not super concerned about him. And while I commended much of what the Tigers did this offseason, the bias signing was fine. Erod, I think, will ultimately find his way back. I know he's off to a sluggish start. I still contend this team should have done more to bolster their lineup. And it may have involved a trade. I like the Meadows trade, right? I like Austin Meadows, but Austin Meadows is a good player. But in a really good lineup, Austin Meadows is like your fifth or sixth best hitter. And there's nothing wrong with that. But like if Austin Meadows is on the White Sox, he'd be batting sixth or seventh. And there's a spot for a guy like that. Really, really good hitter. He's like batting leadoff for the Tigers right now. And now obviously with Baez out, you wonder if the, his effectiveness is going to be diminished. You're getting to a point, sadly, and I hate to do this this early in the season, where you got to consider a moving Torkelson up in the lineup. Because, uh, look, Tork's going to swing and miss. Tork's going to strike out. But at least Torkelson is taking pitches. He's patient at the plate, sometimes too patient. And he's drawing walks. And he can hit for power. Who in this lineup right now, even the good guys, like I like Austin Meadows quite a bit. Austin Meadows doesn't have a home run. He's had all, he's gotten, you know, bap, he, the BAPIP gods have been kind to him. I mean, he's had a few bloop singles, uh, several bloop singles. You don't apologize for it, but that's the thing that has me more worried is I will be very frustrated if this team ends up getting off to another sluggish start because they've lost a lot of games 3-1, to 4-2, to two, where you feel like they've pitched well enough to win and the offensive production just wasn't there. That would be frustrating because we all knew last season that's those were the gaps this team needed to fill. They filled it with Baez, and you could argue they filled it with Meadows, who I like as well, but one of those guys is out now, and we're going to have to see Willie Castro back in the lineup. We're probably going to have to see both the Castros back in the lineup, and that that leads to a lot of disappointment and potentially a lot of frustration. But I talked about it last week, and I'm going to bring it up again here. I don't want to repeat myself too much. It's not panic time yet. I want you to think of all the bullshit this team has already been through, right? The three-week spring training, the lockout, you've had a million different injuries. You know, Torque got off to a bad start. Jamer is off to a bad start. Candelario is off to a bad start. Erod has been really bad his first two outings. Casey Mize is injured. Matt Manning had one good outing that got injured. Scooball got rocked his first start. You know, Soto uh, gave up a, a, a solo home run on opening day that nearly cost him the game. Despite all of that, they're 4-5. and five. They are basically exactly where I thought they'd be. Yesterday's game got postponed, but I predicted, and it's so dumb to predict baseball, it's so random, but I predicted they would go 3-3 three and three on their first homestand and then go 2-2 two and two in their first road series against the Royals, putting them at 5-5. Five and five. Well, they didn't play yesterday, meaning they're 4-5. and five. Now they get the Yankees coming to town, and the Yankees got some really good players. They got a lot of players that would fit well in, in Detroit's lineup, but they just lost 2-3 out of three to the Orioles. They might be mad. Sure, the Red Sox were mad. Tigers played them tough. They should have won two out of three. They didn't. And then you got the Rockies coming to town, who have some boppers in their lineup, but they don't have any pitching. The schedule will clear up. It's I've used this term a million times, just weather the storm. If you can be somewhere between one to five games below 500 by the time the bullpen arms come back and by the time Riley Green comes back, you can be within striking distance. Things are going to get easier. This first month is going to be rough. So take a deep breath. Relax. There's going to come a moment. I promise you guys, there's going to come a moment where I'm going to start to freak out. The offense needs to be better. That's the one thing that's frustrated me the most, is that even with the injuries, there's no reason Jamer, Scope, and some of these guys should be as underwhelming as they've been up to this point in the season. But it was the same way last year. And all those guys that I just mentioned, if they not career years, had some of the best seasons of their career. So I'm... I'm even keel right now, or, you know, as even keel as I can be. There's another thing I wanted to talk about. This is, it, what's it, Tigers adjacent, I guess. I mean, Justin Verlander, by many people, myself included, I think is probably still considered to be a Tiger, though he's been in Astros uniform. Wow, wow this is sixth year, right? 17, 18, 19, 20, 20. Well, I guess last year technically didn't count, so I guess because he didn't pitch. So, you know, he's been away. he's been away from Detroit for a while. But Tigers fans still love him. Tigers fans still pay attention to him. And there were whispers from the second he left Detroit, from the second he was traded in 2017, that he may come back at some point uh, to Detroit. And obviously, he was a free agent at the end of last season, post-Tommy John. And there were whispers that the Tigers may have been making a push, ultimately chose to go back to Houston on a two-year, $50 million contract. And through two starts, he's been stellar. His first start 
His first start was just impressive to see him out there. Five innings, one earned run against the Angels. Pitch data wasn't great, but I mean, we're talking about one start. And then on Saturday against a Mariners team, I really like a Mariners team I picked to win the AL West. He was he was vintage Verlander, man. Eight innings, scoreless, looked great, only threw 87 pitches. Second start by the 39-year-old coming off of Tommy John surgery. He... He looked like the same guy who won the Cy Young three years ago. And I, I that's what I said in my blog. I'm convinced he's a Terminator. There's no way that happens. How? Like, we're talking about a power pitcher. Like, the ultimate power pitcher of this generation, right? Justin Verlander, the meanest fastball alive. Coming off of Tommy John, he's pumping mid-90s. Early in the game, and then obviously late in the game. Because that's how he works. Every pitcher, I, I said this again in my blog, every pitcher should model their game off of Justin Verlander. Because we live in this era where you have to do maximum effort on every single pitch. And I love guys like Jacob DeGrom, but I worry that that's why somebody like DeGrom has struggled, you know, with some injury history, is the fact that they gotta they feel this need to pump 101 in the first inning. If your command is good, you can get guys out with 92-93, and that's been Verlander's MO, man. And he's found a way to pump it back up once he gets late into the game. It was such a fun performance to watch, but... It led to a lot of frustration on Tigers' Twitter by people who were adamant that the Tigers should have made more of a push to sign Justin Verlander. There's two camps, two different ways to look at this, obviously, because if it was my money and I had Chris Illich's money, I would spend the way that Steve Cohen spends, which is that guy there, I like him, I want him, let's sign him. So if it was me this offseason, I would have dished out the money for Correa. I would have dished out the money for Verlander. I would have dished out the money for whoever the best reliever was on the market. I would have cared about making my team a World Series contender this year. But I also understand that that's not, sadly, how most owners work. I I think even to a certain extent, it's unfair to look at Chris Illich and say, his dad wouldn't have done that. Well, right, but his dad was also the exception to the rule that is major league owners. Like, there, he was one of the few owners who said, I don't care about the luxury tax. I will go over if it means that we're going to win it. There's only one other owner, or maybe two, uh, probably the, the Dodgers ownership group, and then obviously Steve Cohen right now, who don't care about that, who are willing to go over the luxury tax. So uh, camp one is, I would have thrown the money at him regardless. But camp two, which is, you know, we're trying to balance our budget a little bit, be a little bit more thrifty, uh, you know, a l- little bit more frugal in regards to how we're spending our money. And you look at Verlander's uh, age and you look at his statistics and you look at the trajectory of a 39-year-old who just clocked his 3,000th inning, not including postseason, not including spring training, taking nostalgia out of it for a second. I know he pitched here. We love him. I, I would cry if Verlander pitched at Comerica Park in a Detroit Tigers uniform again one day. Like, I'm not saying I I wouldn't be happy with it, but I still can't get mad at ownership for not dishing out the money for him. Because when you remove the nostalgia goggles for a second, when you remove the fact that he won an MVP and pitched in two World Series and made a bunch of all-star teams and threw two no-hitters at Detroit, in Detroit, you are looking at a pitcher who was 39 years old, coming off of Tommy John, a power pitcher coming off of Tommy John, right? A guy whose fastball has defined his entire repertoire. Not to say that his other stuff isn't nasty, because it is, but, you know, he's, Verlander's known for the heater. A 39-year-old coming off of Tommy John, pitched a million innings. 99% of the time, that's a death sentence for a pitching career. 99% of the time, that guy doesn't come back from that. And it's why I can't be upset at the Tigers for not making more of a push to bring him back on, you know, I, the Astros gave him two years, $50 million. I would not have given him that. Now, the issue you run into is that, once again, Justin Verlander just is a man who defies all logic. Because last night, or I'm sorry, on Saturday when I watched him pitch, he looked like the same pitcher who won the Cy Young a few years ago, and that guy looked like the same pitcher who was a Cy Young runner-up in 2016, and that guy looked like the same pitcher who won the MVP in 2011. He will pitch into his 40s. Like, I'm confident in that now. Unless there's another another arm blowout, which I doubt there will be, he's probably just going to keep going. And that's why I'm not that upset, because I do think he ends up coming back to Detroit. I bet he pitches these two years in Houston and then has one or two more years, hopefully, back in Detroit. Because I do actually think at some point Houston's window is going to close. I know they're still a good team. But for this instance, as frustrating as it is seeing him just deal, I, I, I can't be upset that they didn't make more of a push because it just goes against what's taught regarding pitchers and pitching injuries. A guy should not be this good this late into his career coming off of not just a major injury, the most major of injuries. 
And I, I might sound upset. It's awesome. It's so cool. We had a guy get pulled from a game when he was throwing a perfect game earlier in the week. And Justin Verlander, 39 years old, has better stuff than anyone in the Tigers organization right now. Think about that. And th- that's not a knock on anyone. It's not a knock on Mize or Manning or Scooball. You know, I think they're going to be wonderful. Scooball was awesome on Friday night, right? But their stuff isn't better than 39-year-old Justin Verlanders. He is a one-in-a-million unicorn. And as much as I would like to see him back in Detroit, it's one of those things you just got to cherish the greatness. I, I say all the time I think gr- greatness gets taken for granted. This is one of those instances. Oh, my God, he hasn't pitched well in the World Series. We're talking about one of the most dominant dudes that's ever lived. And I know, like I said the other week, I think Kershaw's had a better career. I think Clayton Kershaw at his peak was a better pitcher than Justin Verlander, but Kershaw has not had the longevity that Verlander has. Kershaw is 33, and he's like on the verge of shutting it down. Verlander's 39. He looks like he's going to compete for another Cy Young this year. I also think as well, especially during the Avila, Chris Illich era, there's this misconception that just because the Tigers don't sign somebody doesn't mean they didn't make a push. I've heard a lot of rumors, but from relatively reputable sources, is that the Tigers did reach out to Verlander, and Verlander knew what he was worth. He didn't like the asking price, so he came back to Houston on a two-year $50 million deal. And we're also, as much as I'm praising him, really early in the game. And we are two starts into the season. The only person who's really to blame for this whole ordeal is Justin Verlander because he's just too good at pitching. So, yeah, we got a little bit of time here. Uh, I liked the Q&A or AMA uh, thing that we did on Friday's show. I will bring that back maybe every 10 episodes or, or, or so just to answer people's questions and, and expand beyond just Detroit sports or Michigan-based sports stuff because I, I really do believe that stuff can get stale. That's why I don't really like most Detroit sports radio because it's it's the same stuff. But um, I want to talk about something that I haven't really talked about that much and especially I have not talked about since I've been on the podcast and that's um you know my, my, my life, my kind of experiences – Um, as a person who's on uh, the autism spectrum. Like I said, I've joked about it. The Stoolies picked up on it early on, uh, which I thought was fun. And I've, I, trust me, I'm not somebody who believes that if you have an affliction or a disorder, that that's something that shouldn't be joked about. That's why like Will Smith would never survive a day at Barstool. Okay. Because Chris Rock made a joke about his wife and he went on stage and assaulted him. I've heard some jokes about Oh, you know, like being on the spectrum that some stoolies have made that made me laugh hard. Like I, like I think that they can be so clever because it's clear they're well intentioned with it too. Like they're being honest and, and the support by so many of the the barstool people, whether it be fans or people that I work with, has been awesome. But um, yeah, like I said, I've I've talked about it, but I've never really discussed it in full. I guess for people who don't know or may be confused, in summer of 2016. I found out that I was on uh, the autism spectrum. Now, obviously, I, I don't know, maybe not obviously, but I I am what many would consider to be high-functioning. Um, I'm fortunate enough where I can live my life and I'm able to do what I like to do. But I think the more you get to know me, the more apparent it is that um, I'm a little bit different. I have my special interests and... You know, I struggle a lot picking up social cues and in social situations and difficulty making decisions. Uh, a, a lot of times it is subtle. Uh, you really have to know me well to see it. But if you've been around me during a moment of crisis, I think it becomes a very apparent that I am I am prone to the occasional meltdown, right? And um, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes I spiral out of control a little bit. But I, I, it's something I want to discuss because, I, like I said, I found out on – it was, I think it was July of 2016, and I had started to figure it out before that. I, I, I'm fortunate enough to have a support system that is very cognizant and very aware of a lot of these issues. And for the longest time, growing up through all the way through elementary school and even through high school, it was just ADD, learning disabilities. Um, but the older I got... And I do think that it is something potentially, and and I don't want to speak out of turn necessarily, but I do think it is something that can become more apparent the older you get. Maybe it's not that it becomes more apparent to you, it's just you become smarter and you're more aware of your situation and, and you become more sure of who you are as a person. So I was in college, I was in my sophomore year of college, and it was one of those instances that I'd gone through a million times in high school, but it was really starting to hit me in college where I would go to class uh, or a lecture, and I would take notes on things, but I would come back, and I could not 
for the life of me remember a single thing about that class, right? And yet, I would be able to, when I was just kind of shooting the shit with my roommates, be able to rip off these baseball statistics, sports statistics, movie knowledge, you know, trivia stuff. Like, the reason I know stuff and that doesn't, like that kind of stuff. And I was always under the assumption that that was something that, like, everyone is able to pick up on. It wasn't until I kind of broadened my horizons at least a little bit when people were like, it is insane that you know all this. It's insane that you're this knowledgeable on this particular topic. And when you leave high school, because high school is such, regardless of how big or small your high school is, that is such a, a, a small bubble of life that your real life technically starts, you know, once you get to college and try to broaden your horizons a little bit. And I was unable to. I'm not good in social situations. Human beings have a, a pattern that I just haven't picked up on. I, I, I don't, I, I like people. Um, but sometimes I just don't really, I just don't really vibe with them. Uh, I don't, I have a hard time connecting and that is the worst part to me of being on the spectrum is that you always feel like you're on, you're like you're one circle beyond the inner circle. Um, I remember feeling that way in high school. It wasn't like I didn't have friends in high school. It wasn't like I was disliked or unpopular in high school. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't the quarterback, but I always felt like I was not as close to people as I would have liked to be. And a lot of that was my own doing. You know, I was going through my own stuff, even beyond autism. I mean, I'll tell stories like on here one day about social anxiety and, and depression. Though I do think social anxiety is a very common uh, thing that comes with being on the spectrum. But I was getting to college in the hopes that, all right, this is where I'm finally going to kind of branch out and fresh slate, wipe everything clean. You know, these people that some, – some of whom I'd been going to school with for 10, 11 years, all that stuff is gone. I'm back, you know, at, at Central Michigan and – it just wasn't working. Now, going forward, by the last couple of years, while academically things fell apart, I, I still have fond memories of Central. I still love Mount Pleasant. Um, what happened there, I mean, I'll talk about it more one day. It was more academics and, and, and mental health completely falling apart, though that was related to you know, finding out that I was on um, the autism spectrum. But I, I really, in my sophomore year of college, started to do a little bit of research because I, I got to a point, I was 20 at the time, and I got to a point where I'm like, something is permanently off. It's not like high school off where you're just awkward and growing. I feel like a different person than every person that I know. But I, I talked to my family about it, and it was not it was not a stunning thing. And, and the older I'd gotten, the more I, I was starting to get it. And so I went in, I got some testing done, and I was pretty convinced by the time I tested that I had it. And there was weirdly a part of me that was like, I hope I do because I was going back through many different memories of my life and while there's no excuses for self-destructive behavior, a lot of things were starting to come into focus when I was able to look back on them and be like, oh, that was not a result of me being a bad person or me being an ugly person. That was a result of me just just existing on a different wavelength. I think a big reason why I was so, not determined, but so convinced that I had something was just the dating scene, like which I've joked about on here before as well, was like, again, the vibes, just not connecting, not feeling like you were getting, getting to know people. I had friends when I was in college. I didn't have any female friends. And so I just, something felt off. So I went in. To get tested, a gentleman named uh, Dr. Shai uh, tested me for several hours that summer. And so I was 21 when I found out that I was on the autism spectrum. And it is the textbook definition of bittersweet because part of it was like, it's like at the end of a murder mystery, like Knives Out or something. And the, the main detective character flashes back through all the prior events of the movie and everything starts to sync up. Everything starts to make sense. Like, oh... That's why I'm at where I'm at. That's why this happened. That's why I reacted to this in a different way than most other people react to this. And so it's okay because in, in the moment you're like, okay, now all this stuff up to this point makes sense. But then you ask yourself the hard question, which is, am I going to be like this forever? And that uh, – <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> I'm good. I'm good. I uh, 
And that's that's a hard question to ask yourself when you're when you're 21 years old, right? Because you're, I, I hate this whole idea, and, and like college isn't necessary evil for so many people, right? It's a necessary thing. A lot of people really enjoy it, but like, I hate this whole idea that you get to college and this is where you got to figure out what you're gonna do with the rest of your life. Why? Who figures themselves out when they're like 20 years old? So when you find out that news when you're 21, like it's bittersweet and there's positives to it, but it is devastating because you know that going forward. For the rest of your life, there's going to be a lot of things that you do that are extraordinary. Like, I think what I do on here, and guys, I, nobody, like, downgrades myself more than I do, like, but what I do here, the following I've gained, creating videos in my parents' basement, that's extraordinary, right? It is, I'm sorry. Whether you like me or not, that's kind of crazy what's happened. You do know when you find out who you are that there's going to be things that a lot of people you know there's things that they do really easily that you're just never going to be able to do easily. And, and there's no excuse for anything. I, I try not to say, oh, I did this because, oh, I'm on the spectrum. I don't, I don't like doing that. You know, I, I, my, my issues will be my issues and my issues alone. But it's where I'm very grateful to be at where I'm at professionally. And it's why I do get pretty defensive and pretty frustrated when people try to downgrade barstool or misrepresent who we are or what we stand for because I've been working here almost a year and I've never been around a more inclusive group of people. I've never been around more people who made me feel like I belong somewhere than at barstool. And that's as somebody who's you know got a laundry list of issues like that m makes a world of difference. Um so, you know, People can say whatever they want, but we're just going to keep rolling. And it's why I'm grateful to be where I'm at, and I'm grateful to work with the people that I work with. And it's so funny, too, because the as I brought up earlier, the Barstool fans picked up on it early on. I think I think the word or the, the phrase that is used uh, among the Barstool community is this guy's a big trains guy. I, I think that people who are on the autism spectrum, I think there's this misconception that a lot of them have train sets or like trains. So um, I like being a big trains guy. I've never touched a train set in my life, but if that's, you know, the way they want to categorize me, I think that's that's funny um, and neat and unique. I worry that this segment's going to come across as hollow, too, because I don't have some grand thesis here. I, I don't Because I don't want to be phony. I don't like the whole, well, you know, if you just never give up and you be yourself. Well, sometimes people don't like it when you're yourself. I, I guess if there's any lessons, if I don't know if anyone's asking for a lesson that I could give, it's that don't you shouldn't be afraid to learn things. You shouldn't be afraid to listen. And this goes for people who are on the autism spectrum and people who are way off uh, the autism spectrum. Like, we've gotten to a point where nobody's nobody's ever willing to listen anymore. People don't communicate. The greatest gift that we are that we are given is the ability to talk. Whether you like technology or not, we live in a really small world now where if you want to speak to somebody, you can text them right now. And there's people I work with in New York, Chicago, Louisiana, who I can text right now and get a response from. I think that's an amazing gift. And I think that that is actually a great benefit for people who are on the autism spectrum because I, I'll, I, I'll be honest, I feel way more comfortable uh, communicating with people sometimes through text or on a podcast than I do in person. Um, I'm very uncomfortable in person. I, I, I'm comfortable at like three places in the world, and one of them's Comerica Park. The other is in my parents' basement, and I'm still trying to think of the third one. I don't know where it is, but maybe I'll find it one day. Everywhere else, you know, I'm 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 very un unsure of myself sometimes. Maybe when I'm at my buddy Anthony's, I'm pre I'm usually pretty comfortable there. But besides that, you know, um, I, I'm I. I'm a nervous Nelly, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that, um, you know, I have trouble making eye contact, and I have my special interests, and I don't want to talk too much about the Tigers and baseball and movies. I don't want to annoy people. You're always in your own head um, when you're aware of uh, what your afflictions are. But there is also truth to the fact that sometimes the things that you believe are negatives, the things that you believe can be detriments, those things can make you great, and... Um, I hope that one day I can get to a point where I feel that way about myself. That'd be pretty cool. I don't know what a confident Chris Castellani looks like. I, I You guys might not be able to stand it. I'm not sure. But um, hopefully we get there one day. So, yeah, I don't I don't know if I'm going to upload this last segment. But um, whether I do or not, that will do it for today's show.
and I think this was a good one. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Castellani2014. While you're at it, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Let's get those watch hours up, up, up. We are on Apple Podcasts. We are on Spotify. You can follow us on all those platforms, whatever podcasting platform you prefer to listen to. We will be right back here on Friday recapping several Tiger games, and we'll see what other news breaks. Who knows? I don't know. But thank you very much uh, for watching, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Peace and happiness.